Welcome back to my ethics series. In this video, we're going to be talking about medical malpractice. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. Before I get into today's video, please click that join button. When you click that join button, which you can see in multiple locations on my channel, you'll become a Dirty Medicine member, which means that in exchange for providing secure financial support of my channel for $4.99 per month, you'll get some cool perks. That join button can be found on my channel homepage underneath every video, as well as that's the link, that first link in the description of every video. Thank you very much for your consideration. Now in today's video, we're going to be talking about medical malpractice. And when it comes to medical malpractice, really the high yield thing to know for USMLE or Comlex are the four components that make up medical malpractice, which is to say that in order for medical malpractice claims to be legitimate in the eyes of the law, these four components need to be present. So here's what we have. The first is an act, and that's going to be an act of negligence or an act of omission. The second is a duty. So the physician has a duty to the patient. So therefore, we could restate that as saying that a doctor-patient relationship had to have been established. Now, this is an important component because if a physician is walking through the park and something happens to a patient, that physician is obviously not liable under medical malpractice because that physician had no duty to that patient. The third component is a breach. And this is really, I think, the most important thing to, to understand when it comes to medical malpractice is that this breach means that the physician deviated from the standard of care. Now the question then becomes, what is the standard of care? And how do we know if a physician deviated from it? Well, the model that's most often used is what's called the reasonably similar model or the reasonably similar standard, which basically asks what would a reasonable similar physician do in similar circumstances. And using that standard, that can be applied to different situations in which medical malpractice is being considered. And therefore, different legal jurisdictions can ask themselves, given what a reasonable, similar physician would have done in similar circumstances, was there a breach, i.e., was this physician's care a deviation from that standard, all right? So you have to establish that the breach occurred. And then lastly, there are damages. And it's important to point out that these are causal damages, which means that damages occur. So we'll do an example in just a moment, but something bad happens to the patient. And the word causal means that there is a causal relationship between the breach occurring and the damages resulting, right? Because if a patient has something that happens to them but there are no damages one could argue that there's no legal basis for a medical malpractice claim now i understand that a lot of this terminology and the way that i'm speaking might be new to a lot of you because after all you're medical students and now we're suddenly talking about something that law students learn but nonetheless you're going to be a physician so it's very important that you understand medical malpractice so what i'd like to do now is let's do an example, and I've, I've written this example here in a, in a small paragraph, and we'll go through this example, and we'll t we'll, I'll point out the four components within this example so that you can see where the act, duty, breach, and damages are within an example so that if on USMLE or Comlex you get such an example, you're able to state the criteria or maybe even say which one is not present. So here's our example. A 46-year-old woman undergoes an abdominal surgery performed by her general surgeon. Four hours post-op, she is writhing in pain, and after requesting multiple rounds of additional pain medication, the attending physician orders an x-ray which demonstrates the presence of a surgical instrument left behind in the abdomen during the procedure. The patient develops sepsis, but ultimately does recover. All right, so if you want to reread that in your head one more time, pause the video and reread it. But now let's go through this practice question and dissect it and point out the four components of medical malpractice. So the first one is the act, right? Something had to happen on which this whole medical malpractice claim might be established. 
And in this example, the act is the abdominal surgery. Now, I'll discuss this in just a few seconds when we get to number three, when we get to the breach, but oftentimes the act and the breach are very, very closely interrelated. So in reality, if you were taking an exam, it wouldn't be so clear cut to say this is the act and this is the breach because oftentimes the act and the breach are one and the same, right? The act is a negligent act which deviates from the standard of care. And that second part is the definition of a breach. So I could say that the act and the breach are the abdominal surgery and the surgical instrument being left behind. But for simplicity's sake, and to take a reductionist approach, I'm just going to say that the act is the abdominal surgery. Now, number two, the duty is that it's her general surgeon. So clearly there's a doctor-patient relationship established here. Now, a lot of times on USMLE or Comlex, this duty will be implied because it'll tell you that a patient goes in for some procedure or that a patient is you know, seeing a doctor for some reason. And it doesn't tell you that the patient signed all the consent forms and the doctor has been seeing her for six months. No, it's, it's implying that there's a doctor-patient relationship. So a lot of times this will be implied, but just to make it really clear cut, I wrote her general surgeon because I want you to know that there is a clear doctor-patient relationship and therefore the duty component is present. Now, the breach is that the presence of a surgical instrument is noted. It was left behind in the abdomen. And remember that the definition of a breach is a deviation from the standard of care. And the standard of care is what a reasonable physician would have done in similar circumstances. So the question now is, would a reasonable physician under similar circumstances doing an abdominal surgery, would a reasonable physician have left a surgical instrument in the abdomen? And the answer is an overwhelming obvious no. Dirty, you idiot. Uh, and therefore, the breach is established because this is a deviation from the standard of care. So going back to what I said a few seconds ago, number one, act, and number three, breach, are oftentimes pretty much the same criteria or the same components within a practice question because you can't have the abdominal surgery, well, you can't have a, the negligent act without the consequence, and you can't have the deviation from the standard of care without the act. So the breach, for simplicity's sake here, is that there was the surgical instrument left behind in the abdomen. And now lastly, the question is, well, what are the damages? What did the patient suffer as a result of this act or as a result of this breach? And this patient developed sepsis, unfortunately. But luckily, in my practice question, the patient lives. So you see the four different criteria here. It's very important to understand that these four all must be present for medical malpractice claims to be legitimate under the eyes of the law. All right, now the, the only other thing that I really want to point out, which is probably more high yield than anything I've said so far, is when you're talking about medical malpractice, and specifically we're talking about breaches, sometimes you don't need to establish the breach as a deviation from the standard of care. Sometimes the breach is so bad and so obvious that we use the term res ipsa locator to signify that this breach, we don't even need to argue it in a court of law. Like, this is so bad, just look at this. And res ipsa locator, which I'm, I'm no doubt butchering the pronunciation, but it, it means the thing speaks for itself. So on USMLE or Comlex, if you see an image like this, I mean, obviously, there's a surgical instrument in somebody's abdomen. This is so bad, and this is so obviously a deviation from the standard of care that there's nothing to be established here. Any legal jurisdiction would look at this and be like, yeah, thumbs up, that's a breach. So that, if, this, if you see this, that's res ipsa locator, and that phrasing shows up on exams all the freaking time. But that's it for this video. That was a quick high yield run through of medical malpractice. In summary, know the four components, act, duty, breach, damages, and know what res ipsa locator means and how to apply it.